All right, hello, and uh, thank you for joining us in this uh, in this session. So I have the privilege of uh, of being here with uh, uh, Miko Matsumura and Felix uh, Mago, and we we're going to talk about uh, the uh, the intricacies of uh, of crypto exchanges and uh, some interesting insights, some interesting perspective about the development of crypto exchanges and their role in the in the crypto market. Uh, my name is Jesus Rodriguez. I'm the CEO of Into the Block, uh, we uh, focus on providing uh, market intelligence by using data science and trying to extrapolate intel from everything that happens at the blockchain level, at the exchange level, at the derivative level. So exchanges are a topic uh, very close to my heart these days. Uh, but uh, before starting, I would like to let my two, uh, my two panelists introduce themselves. So Miko, we know each other for 15 years or something, but I think this is the first time that I get the, the opportunity of hammer you at a conference. So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, it's terrific. Really appreciate it. And, uh, you know, it's great to be uh, hanging out with you here. Uh, so uh, in terms of my introduction, I'm a co-founder of an exchange, Evercoin Exchange, and it's mobile wallet based non-custodial exchange. Uh, and it's... Uh, sort of the most, we, we say it's the most secure mobile wallet and exchange. Uh, so that's Evercoin. And then I also deploy capital out of a venture capital fund called Gumi Crypto's Capital. And, uh, you know, we look for exciting projects. So that, that's, uh, that's my uh, and and because you're you're a modest person and you're not gonna say it i'm gonna say it uh i known you for a long time and you have had a, a remarkable career across uh, across different technical industries from the service oriented architecture days to the cloud days to the big data days and now crypto so it's uh Thanks whatever so industry you get whatever industry you start working on i, I should just follow and i think i'm gonna do okay Thank uh you Felix, so much. How, how about yourself T tell us about you and dash next thank you thank you for having me tonight so i'm felix mago co-founder of dash next dash next is one of the many projects within the dash ecosystem and we are based here in asia i'm out of bangkok tonight um and what we're doing is uh, partnerships business development marketing for dash so we're onboarding merchants on all verticals of the payment industry my background also very much from the uh, consulting side of things. I was a bank and finance consultant before, helped uh, them to become more digital. That uh, went so-so, as you can see with many banks and paper-based processes. So now I'm very happy. I'm focusing for yeah, for last uh, more than five years now in the blockchain space, very much focused on crypto payments and on mass adoption. Because at the end of the day, it's kind of funny that we're sitting here 2020 and still talking uh, about that the main use case is exchanges in cryptocurrency, whereas we have so many cool projects that are actually doing real world stuff and real businesses. So yeah, let's dive into it. Oh, this is gonna be, this is gonna be fun. We have two perspectives: a wallet provider and an anti-exchange uh, person. So let's let's start with uh, with sort of um, a polemic topic. Um, in a few years ago, everybody wanted to have a wallet, be a wallet provider. Uh, a few years after that, everyone wanted to build an exchange. Uh, these days, I, I get the feeling that the lines between those two are, are blurring a little bit, that uh, the wallets are looking more like exchanges and centralized exchanges uh, are providing services that look uh, more like uh, like wallet providers. So. Miko, as a, as a as an operator in a sort of let's say next generation wallet um, uh, provider, how, how do you see the lines between those two and the future? Well, uh, I think the thing that is really I think fundamental is that you know we're talking about open source financial infrastructure and we're talking about essentially the migration of users towards a much more inclusive and consent-based uh, financial infrastructure. So in order for that to happen, you know, we basically need to, uh, you know, uh, there, it, right now what's happening is a sort of an existential battle between, you know, people who are recreating the centralized financial system, you know, and those who are sort of uh, paving a new way. And I think the thing that's funny about it is when you think about the creation of an of a alternative, a true alternative, I think it's, really based on use cases, right? So, I mean, you know, I think to highlight this, you know, I, one of the things you're probably able to see uh, from Into the Block 
is you're probably able to see kind of um, record amounts of Bitcoin actually being pulled off of the exchanges and into wallets, right? So, you know, the thing that's, I think, very interesting about that is, is that as that movement strengthens, you start to get a uh, hodl and, you know, a concept that I kind of uh, coined this morning when I got out of bed, which I call hedgel. Uh, you know, which are which are kind of really primary use cases, right? These and I think there's even a third primary use case, which is kind of interest and kind of interest bearing uh, crypto, whether it's centralized or decentralized. So, you know, my 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 thoughts are that you know historically those forces are kind of pitted against just pure speculation, and, and pure speculation is what you see uh, when you see the whales jumping in and out and you see this pumping and dumping effect, you know, and I think those two forces are kind of like pressing against one another in this time. Uh, Felix, could you complement that? How do you see mm -hmm. the lines between wallets and exchanges in the future? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for me, it's also about very much about use cases. I can only agree with uh, what Miko just said, you know, for me, also coming from the side who is who is doing adoption and who is trying to convince regular merchants that are completely non-crypto that are in fact you know don't really care about crypto never looked into it and we're talking with so many merchants and you know the main, most common question is do I have to invest anything do I have to take any risk and how can I be sure that uh, tomorrow half of the money is not lost right so for us it's a very uh, key factor to really find uh, fiat on off ramps, and in order to do that, you have to comply, you know, with local regulations, with local governments, and this is exactly why we also need blockchain Intel, you know, to provide to provide data. Because you know, I mean, at the end of the day, it's nice to uh, to dream along and to be uh, uh, on the we we revolutionize everything. But at the end of the day, you know, if you want to do real business and if you want to drive real adoption, you always come sooner or later to the point that you have to integrate in, in, in classic systems. So, you know, it's it's for us really- So let, let me press a done. little bit on that. Um, let me press a little bit on that point. Are, are wallets going to be a concept uh, a, a few years from now, or they're just going to be part, you know, hidden behind other things and just being like a, a key infrastructure point that you use and nobody cares about uh, how they work uh, internally? Now, please don't get me wrong. I'm I'm absolutely pro financial freedom and absolutely pro be you know have your own finances be do whatever you want you want you know it's like it's your money it's your choice this is like kind of our claim as well. So I'm I'm completely pro with it, right? But for me, it's about giving users choices. And you know, we are still we're 2020, and I was just joking with Miko. We are 2020. Everybody's talking for over a decade now on, hey, we can buy now stuff with cryptocurrency. You know, it's the number of the only use case that you can trade it and you can speculate with it, right? For me, with like want to drive this uh, uh, digital cash and and want to drive like real mass adoption to go out buy a hamburger tonight right to go out buy my next hotel room with with uh, cryptocurrency or dash or whatever it is right we're still so far away and this is why we have to you know uh, deal with the realities and the reality is many people are super far so for me it's not you know you can't educate every user to be uh, a crypto anarchist most probably many people don't care and won't ever care, right? So for me, it's about offering choices and, and giving opportunities, you know, and if if you need a fiat exit, so be it, you know, I'm happy, I'm more happy you will accept cryptocurrencies with a fiat exit than you only accept visa payments. Interesting. So uh, le let me let me take a, a, a tangent here. So in the uh, most, uh, most, crypto exchanges uh, today, their model out of the traditional capital markets, active investor exchange with order books and flashing lights and uh, uh, and all those things. Um, that's, those are products for traders and, and active uh, investors. Um, wh where are we leaving the passive investors, right? Amigo, I think you, you spent some time thinking of, about this, like it, the, it, the future of any, the, in any, asset class passive investment plays uh you know a, a substantial role and when we look at crypto 
it doesn't seem that we have a ton of products for that. So is that something that exchanges should be looking at? It's something that wallets uh, should be looking at, or, or how does the uh, what are your thinkings in uh, your thinking in that area? Yeah, so uh, I I'm le <clears throat> I guess to use kind of a phrase from the popular culture, you know, I'm less kind of aggressively binary, you know. So I, I kind of, you know, uh, you could call me a crypto non-binary person. You know, the the mood around this is that it's important to understand that it's not DeFi versus CFI, right? It, it, like if you look at uh, something like neo banking. Right. So neo banking, like if you look at like Cash App or if you look at Revolut, you can buy Bitcoins and you can also access kind of what I would call legacy financial infrastructure, you know, and that's actually meaningful. Right. And the to me, the thing that's interesting when you talk about this kind of tension is, is that, yes, like obviously something like Binance is built for pure speculation. But when you start to look at what Coinbase is offering in terms of things like staking products. Right. Then a passive investor can go into Coinbase. Right. And, you know, and so what I mean by non binary is, is that Coinbase is 100 percent centralized. Right. But they're also offering things like, you know, staking uh, in the sense of kind of things that that mirror real world interest. Right. So people are collecting interest and that's a passive function. Right. So a passive investor, as you describe them, can go to Coinbase and they can collect interest or staking rewards. Uh, you know, it, it, they're they have both. Right. So so my point is, is that, um, you know, it's not necessarily kind of an either or, you know, I think I think, um, you know, it's it, Felix said it well, which is it's about choices, you know, and I think that that people are making choices now, I think. The idea that people are choosing only speculation, I think, is an old narrative and it's a tired narrative, right? Because, you know, if you look at this idea of I mentioned that that uh, the number of bitcoins held in kind of cryptocurrency exchanges is kind of at an 18 month low. It's around two point three million Bitcoin, you know, out of not, you know, maybe 20 20 million. I don't know how many have been lost forever. Maybe like, you know, chain analysis says that maybe as many as 4 million Bitcoins have been lost forever, you know, and, and we haven't reached the 21 million in terms of, you know, continued uh, having. But, you know, what I really wanted to point out is that, uh, you know, in terms of the use cases, we don't have to have people buying burgers as the only mindset for use cases. Now, I, I value that mindset, and I think it's a hugely important and powerful mindset, and I'm also confident that we'll get there. Like, that, like that's going to happen, but the point is, is the idea that someone's collecting interest, even if it's on a centralized exchange, that's a choice, and that's evolution, and that's a passive investor, and if someone is withdrawing to an Evercoin or withdrawing to a ledger or withdrawing to a Trezor, that's also a use case, which is hodling. And hodling is really, I think it's it's hedging. And another use case can be, so, you know, call it uh, fiat uh, monetary uh, insurance. And then, and another use case can be thinking about it in the context of like um, hedging, right? So hedging means, you know, improving your sharp ratio by holding something that may be somewhat decorrelated from some of the other things in your basket. So, so these are all use cases. So I think people who are like speculation is the only use case, I think they're really not kind of like enumerating real world functional use cases that exist today. Uh, you know, and, and I don't think we need to go as far as buying a burger, which I think is it's there's a lot of challenges to being able to do that. I think the first people that may launch something like that may be Square because Square mm -hmm. owns both the uh, user side with Cash App and they own the merchant side. So like, and they're getting really into places like Africa. And so like, you know, Square may be the first company to do a uh, kind of mass scale retail user payment, but you know, on, on blockchain or Bitcoin, but I, or on any cryptographic asset on Dash for that matter. So, you know, I, yeah, I, so I, 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 go ahead. I spent some time thinking about this. Please go ahead, Felix. Next time no, I but please go. Miko, I take you out for a good meal in, in Dash, for that matter. Come yeah, to Bangkok, yeah, well, burger. fantastic shops, and my belly is getting bigger and bigger only on crypto. I can promise you that. I would like to add on one Wonderful. point you mentioned because you said neo banks. You know, for me, it's also one is the user side of things, the other one is also the business side of things. I mean, let's be honest, we are 
very much in, a, in an industry where many people never ever thought really about business models. And I mean, if you look at the usage and the, the users, you know, we are with many businesses very far away that in, in ever anybody is generating a profit, right? On the other side, you mentioned the word neo banking, and I, I said before I was working as a financial consultant before, and I was working in banks on the SAP side of things, you know, with like core banking systems from the 80s. And at any given point in time, these banks had an army of around 50 external people just to keep the core banking systems from the 80s running, right? So For we're like, sure. I mean, this business model is also so far outdated, right? And on the other side, we are like, we have an amazing te technology and sometimes cannot pull off a, a business model to make money with it, right? So in this sense, exchanges were the businesses who, you know, they are the, the successful businesses in the space by kind of by far, like every financial mm -hmm. instrument, right? And this is, as I see it, why also many staking services are popping up. And there's a, I mean, this is also why, the competition was so high suddenly in this market, right? There are more and more exchanges were popping up. And now really it's about like features, usability on exchanges. And I mean, for me personally, from my user side of things, you know, I see a million exchanges out there and ask myself like, why, you know, why should I change? Like what's, for, what's in for me as a user? And when I look for me as a user, I look at my, my first trading account from stock market trading account from 1998 and still wonder why the hell where all the features I had in 1998 when I want to trade crypto, like a stop limit or trailing orders or OCO or whatever there is, right? It's, it's kind of funny how uh, immature we still are and on the same time so far ahead of uh, all the old traditional world, you know? I think uh, um, one yeah. of the things, yeah, yeah go, go ahead, go ahead, Jesus. No, uh, I, I was going to say, so to the point that, that you were making that the, the, their, um, the market is choosing a speculation, um, I think the number of products for, uh, uh, to foment uh, speculative behavior far surpasses the number of products that for passive investors uh, today. So what do we yeah. have? Staking, lending, and a couple of things, and the experiences are still complicated. So Coinbase is certainly taking a step in the right direction or, or at least in, in that direction. Uh, but uh, the, the, the interesting question is, uh, um, can, can we make the money for passive investors smarter, right? Because most passive investors, we see this all the time, Bitcoin sitting on wallets there forever, right? And they, they're not earning interest. They're not doing anything. They're just there, right? And uh, and being a programmable asset class, we should be able to build smarter mechanisms for for that for that crypto to to increase its value. Yeah, I think you know one of the areas that's very rich in this topic is the decentralized finance or DeFi applications. And I think DeFi applications, in a lot of ways, are kind of missing really positive user experiences. You know, I think the other thing that's really important is that we, you know, we still suffer from sort of fundamental technology issues like the Oracle problem, you know, things of that nature. So, you know, I, I do think we are a ways away from really being successful at that kind of like paradigm. But, you know, I just want to really kind of continue to draw attention towards kind of this principle of neobanking as kind of a huge potential equalizer. I think the idea that retail investors can get something that's smart or can get much, much better or improve financial services, like, I think it's pretty early. I think it's early for that. And the, I think the positive good news is, is that when you look at passive investors, passive investors have the potential to set the floor. And what what I see happening with this kind of titanic struggle between sort of pure speculation and kind of hodling or hedgling, you know, is really that this kind of slower investment pattern seems to be ratcheting up the floor price, right? Which is that there's obviously support and resistance, and we're seeing this kind of 10K resistance. We're seeing quite a lot of resistance. But the point that I'm making is, is that all that has to happen is, is that people keep needing to buy the dips, you know, which ratchets up the support. So the support level just keeps rising over time. And I call this kind of jokingly the 10-year moving average. You know, so the 10 year moving average is actually something that is, it turns out, is a reasonably strong effect and it's a network effect. And, you know, I, I obviously it's, it may be slower than most people want, you know, but I think that, you know, obviously it's, 
it's certainly uh, something that's very real. And, uh, you know, so I, I feel like it's an inevitability that this will continue, especially if people continue to perform this kind of, uh, you know, I think one of the things that I wanted to interject is that Jesus is CEO of Into the Block, which is like this super uh, amazing uh, technical analysis resource for Bitcoin and blockchain. Uh, you know, which you can see just about anywhere you want. You can see it on coin market cap and whatnot. But one of the questions I want to point back to you actually is, uh, you know, how do you see this pattern of people who are kind of not selling? Like, do you, you know, are you seeing a lot of wallets that sort of accumulate on dips and just hang out? Like, you know, and how big is that phenomenon versus the people that are just kind of really blitzing money in and out like every single, you know, uh, tick? Yeah, so we uh, in, in so depending on the blockchain that you use, there are different ways to analyze that. In something like Dash, to use that example, a way to look at that is uh, looking at UTXOs uh, transactions, right? That allows you to see the age of of, of certain uh, uh, of certain coins. And depending on the time of the market, you can see these trends very clearly. Like uh, Dash that have been held for three years, that trend, you know, shrinking, and you can see with those co- or big coins that have been older than five years moving and we see uh, we see those trends all the time more recently there were two events that that produced big movements one was the march 11 crash right that you could literally see massive amount we were talking about money moving out of exchanges into wallets you could see massive amount of influx into exchanges to be liquidated like moving from wallets into binance just to liquidate those uh those positions and the other one was the halvening and i was doing my session at consensus the day of the halving, actually, I had two hours before, and people were asking about metrics about that, and I sh- I show almost a number of metrics that were funny, saying like, look, the number of addresses that hold over a ten thousand a thousand Bitcoin is on an all time high, like not exchanges, just normal normal addresses, and people get excited about that. I said, but hold on, hold on, the number of addresses that hold one Bitcoin is also at an all time high. So you can see that yep. the big whales accumulating, but you can see that the, the little guys are also also accumulating. Uh, so we're seeing those trends like uh, all over uh, all over the place. Let me let me build on a point that you made about DeFi for a second, because we're talking about exchanges and and a, a component. It's hard to talk about exchanges in crypto without talking about decentralized exchanges. Are decentralized exchanges like done? Like, is that uh, like I like to pick polemic arguments? So, uh, are they like gone? Are they gonna exist? Are they relevant? Are we decentralizing something that that doesn't need to be decentralized? Uh, I, I was doing so. I teach at Columbia University a few classes every year, and a few weeks ago I was doing this class, and we got into a topic of what needs to be decentralized versus centralized. And I've been thinking a lot lately that I. I, I get the feeling that we're 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 trying to decentralize things that do not need to be decentralized at at the moment, and and uh, so I'm coming full circle on that. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm landing on the right place. Uh, so is is decentralized exchanges that like we're just looking for uh, uh, for for a um, a solution to a problem that doesn't exist? Yeah, uh, I want to jump in, right, which is that, uh, you know, if you look at it, the the whole argument of decentralized exchange is in a way a little bit like the argument around decentralized finance, which is it it turns into this kind of like weird kind of religious discussion, which doesn't have much meaning, Uh, because to be perfectly honest, you know, as an exchange operator, like what exactly are you trying to decentralize? Because if you try to tell me that you're trying to decentralize the order book, I'm going to tell you that that's just a bad idea. It's an inherently bad idea, right? Now, if you want to say that you're trying to decentralize custody, then I would say that's a fantastic idea and that's what Evercoin is doing, right? Because the idea of an exchange is the idea that you come to a a place and that place allows you to exchange, right? So the idea that you're coming to a place, can't you can't decentralize the place where people come to exchange, right? So I, I, to me, like the reason I, that's a little semantic, but the point I'm really trying to make is actually more that uh, it, that's a super un nuanced argument. But, but what I want to do is see what's happening where people are, are are going with their feet, right? So for example, like if you talk to Alex at IDEX, like 
you know, it turns out that IDEX is sort of, um, you know, it's it's not even a DEX, but that's not a problem. Like it's a great financial service and people enjoy using it and it's beneficial and it allows the users to maintain self-custody, you know, as Evercoin does as well, right? But the point is, is that did, did we decentralize the order book? No. And it, to me, the idea of DEX is really competing for the role of BitTorrent in the media industry. So what's more important? Spotify in music or BitTorrent, right? And so as a as a company, would you rather be Spotify or would you rather be BitTorrent? The reason why I like to talk about neobanks and I like to talk about Square and Cash App is because that's the model that is going to be more impactful than DEX. Like I think DEX is basically trying to become BitTorrent. And the question is, are they going to disappear? No, they won't disappear. Did Bitcoin, did, did, did BitTorrent disappear? It didn't. Right. Is it is it the most important thing in the music industry? No, it's it's definitely not. Uh, you know, Napster disappeared. BitTorrent did not disappear. One, time, one point I would like to add, you know, is like it has different perspectives. It's a completely different story if you're a project owner who's trying to get listed at an exchange and has like quite ridiculous prices if you look around and it doesn't end only with listing fees. You have to put market making and a lot of other expenses that are kind of monthly and that are very hard to bear for a young project especially um so it has not only the user side right and from the user side obviously uh, uh, i mean at the end of the day you want to you don't want to end up trading your coins where, without liquidity right so uh these are, are two sides of the same coin and i think uh, decentralized exchanges have no, no, but, but be, be more direct so are dexes here to stay or or the or the concept mm -hmm. is hardly irrelevant uh at this point. I think it's about it's about the use case and it has to evolve. You know, I just saw one uh, one new project which says instead of giving uh, uh, monthly money to market making to a centralized exchange, we decentralize our own project. And if you buy our token, X percent of what you buy goes to market making and to provide liquidity for our own decentralized exchange in the background. Right. So this is like a use case I can see makes sense. Right. So for them, they want to ensure liquidity. They want to ensure that people can buy their token for ease. So why not? You know, this is an idea. And I think we just haven't seen the killer killer use case yet. And this is why most decentralized exchanges just have quite empty order books, right? And this is why for yeah. me as a user, I have very low incentives to go there. Uh, I'll be more aggressive okay, so and just say that Dex, Dex as a pure concept doesn't matter. And I will even go as far to say that DeFi as what I call a pure concept I is, just is also my next question. pretty challenged. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so let, let's talk about that. Like, I, I'm mm -hmm. I have three more questions. That each one of them are very polemic. So let, let, that was going to be the next question. So DeFi, there is a lot of hype around it. Uh, and uh, when you look at the services that are being provided, it's also questionable whether, uh, whether there is real... Um, value at scale let me pick my words here carefully because i think intellectual is interesting but but is is that you know is that really a concept is that really a pillar of a, of a new financial architecture at this point or what we need is more programmable finance and less you know decentralized decentralized finance yeah i love that mm -hmm. mindset and distinction right because to me when i see things like uh, interest bearing cryptographic exchange. And when I see interest bearing crypto in the form of things like smart contracts, like I think that's absolutely a vital application. I think one of the risks in this kind of DeFi world is the dependency on this idea of a decentralized Oracle. And I think that that's really problematic, right? A de trying to decentralize an Oracle is problematic. And I think the financial industry's existing, pre-existing solution is to find a provider that is centralized and you trust that provider for the Oracle, right? But, the, but other, you know, and the reason why that works is because what you have, the code, it turns out that code isn't law. It turns out that the law is the law. And, and if you believe that law is law, then you have to believe that you could actually get legal certainty instead of relying on kind of like mathematical certainty, you know, because the thing that I think is important about financial services is that financial services really are much more about financial certainty, which is underpinned by legal certainty, right? And, and having rights. And so, you know, not to be kind of the old curmudgeon, but like to me, I think that 
Uh, I I love kind of seeing interest bearing crypto projects. I love seeing DeFi, and I love to see the velocity of money through primary use cases that are exciting billions of dollars of asset value, right? So so to me, like I'm a fan of everything going on over there, you know. So I, I'm not a naysayer. I'm just saying that like you know, uh, people who are applying decentralized purity tests, uh, don't really understand problems like Oracle sufficiently to satisfy like me in terms of building out a, a real I infrastructure for financial services. You know, I, I just think okay. that's not a, the right way. Let you know, me, let me to, I, to wrap this up. Uh, I have one more question, Felix. I'm going to start with you. And then I have two rapid fire questions. <laughs> yes or no, that are, that are controversial. So the, I was saving this one for the end. So centralized exchanges, we cannot, we cannot talk about it without talking about the, the problems with wash trading, spoofing, and, uh, and, and all those things. Uh, so, Felix, any ideas how to solve those problems? What can they do? I mean, it's subject to this is one of the pains of my existence, right? It's, it's, uh, mm -hmm. it, there's all sorts of market manipulation, uh, trading behind the scenes, was trading, spoofing. Any ideas that come to mind that just publishing stuff to the blockchains will help? Right. If they if they actually did that, uh, what can it centralize as like centralized exchanges do? OK, let me give you a very quick answer, because I would love to add something what Nico just said. Uh, I, I think, you know, we uh, uh, from the usual financial industry, there's a lot of standards. And, you know, if if they weren't there, the, uh, the stock market would be the same mess like crypto is. Right. So maybe it's a lack of regulation and. This is why, you know, companies like like blockchain Intel and, and such are popping up and, are, you know, they have their space as as much as I sometimes would like that they are not there and that we have completely our financial freedom. You know, I personally made my year and this is uh, to add on Nico, uh, 2020, the year of DAOs. And, you know, for me, your question, your previous question is very much a matter of perspective. We many times tend to be very Western focused, you know, me living here in Bangkok and going around in different Asian countries, I realize it's a completely scattered market. In fact, we just, you know, just started an, uh, an our outreach in the Philippines and to get strong there, you know, it's like, it's a completely different world out there. And I mean, imagine being a Filipino, being an African, right? And try to get a job in the States, try to get a job in Europe. It's, it's friggin' impossible, you know? It's like you have to go through HR departments, you have to get a passport. We can pull off DAOs now. They're just like things in the internet, you know? They don't care where you come from. They don't discriminate you from with your passport, you know? It's like they, you have to build trust, you have to show that you can do stuff. And one major thing about adoption and also to get us out of, you know, only having the use case exchange and trading is people need to earn money in crypto, you know, then it's suddenly your price reference. So I assume we mostly earn in crypto, you know, if you go out and get a hotel room, you probably think like, uh, I don't know, 0 0.1 dash is an expensive cheeseburger, right? So this is exactly what I want. So I'm, I'm you know, I'm German, I live in Thailand, I earn in crypto, what is my personal price reference? You know, it's dash. And I'm happy about that, you know, the moment you start thinking about that, it's like, <laughs> Going to the U.S. Hey, is just a pain if I had to get uh, USD out of the bank. Uh, Quickly about the, the transparency yeah. issue, we were getting pressed by the uh, to to wrap this up, and I still have two quick questions. So, um, uh, what do you think centralized exchanges should do to improve transparency? Uh, I think that uh, we what we need to see is we need to see things like blockchain settlement. Right. Which, of course, makes them non-custodial. Right. Because uh, that's really the place where, you know, and so if you think about a non-custodial exchange like Evercoin, you know, it, you can call whatever you want. This, the order book is centralized. Right. But the point. So I think centralized decentralized is the wrong axis. You know, I think custody and blockchain based settlement is the axis. And I think that's what we need, because otherwise we don't know what the hell they're doing back there. And it's probably bad. OK, so one more question. Uh, very quickly, uh, a controversial opinion that you have about exchanges in crypto that most, by, by definition, most people are going to disagree with. I'm going to say mine. I, I, I think the winner in the exchange category is a type of product we haven't seen before. We haven't seen yet. Like, it's not what we're seeing today. Okay, my, my controversial statement is Cash App is awesome 
and Coinbase is crashing all the time. And I think Cash App is going to win. That's my That's thought. not controversial. <laughs> Everybody okay. knows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, Felix. Uh, my controversial statement would be, I you know, I... I like to see every payment company succeed because I believe uh, it's the entry for crypto to go also in there to be an additional means of payment and not the only alternative. And I think every, everything has the right to be there. You, you two need to check what the controversial really means. But OK, so with that, uh, we're, we, we need to close the panel. Thank you very much uh, uh, to uh, Miko and Felix for joining me today. And I hope you enjoy the show. Thank you.